Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine we put together each week at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy so that you go off into the week with knowledge about things that your friends will be asking you for. Amaze your friends at the water cooler. We've got a great program uh, this week, uh, Re- Repeal and Replace. Big part of the headline, Sally Pipes from the Pacific Research Institute will be joining us shortly. But we kick off, uh, and it may be early on a weekend morning for this, or perhaps late on a weekend evening uh, to discuss this. But we're going to talk about distillers and how they're treated in the Commonwealth of Virginia with Jarrett Dieterle of the R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. Read his stuff on the AmericanConservative.com website. Jarrett, welcome back to Freedom and Prosperity Radio. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Not at all. And we're going to try to keep this as careful as because there is a candidate for governor who is a distiller. But uh, I want to begin with uh, the well, the beginning of the alphabet, ABC. Does uh, Virginia's problem with distillers and distilleries and uh, distilled spirits all begin with the idea that they still need to control this as a function of government? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest uh, issue, actually, that uh, distillers face is the uh, ABC system. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a government-controlled uh, system where the government essentially runs and controls all the sales of uh, hard liquor uh, in the state of Virginia. And that really hurts distilleries in, in multiple ways. I mean, one, first of all, is that they have a lot of markups, ABC does, mm-hmm. uh, on the amount of money that the bottles of booze sell for. So they have a 69% markup, for example, which is wow. uh, you know, the industry standard is 20%. So that shows you how high of a markup that is. Yeah, um, And they control everything. I mean, from the way that they can sell their bottles uh, to the you know cash flow for these businesses to pretty much everything in their mm-hmm. day-to-day is some kind of ABC control and regulation. Now, I know that uh, several years ago when Bob McDonnell was elected governor, he, one of his agenda items was going to be uh, getting out of the alcohol business, and he faced an interesting coalition of uh, opposition in the General Assembly. You had most all of the Democratic caucus who didn't want to give up the tax revenue, and then you had enough of the Republican caucus from the very socially conservative parts of Virginia who didn't want to give up uh, the idea that somehow if we didn't control the alcohol sales, we'd all be drunk in the streets and that you know, we needed right. to control the social behavior. Is, is Virginia ever going to reform as long as there's enough folks like that to create this coalition against getting out of the alcohol business? Well, you certainly hope so. Not only is it the two constituencies that you mentioned, but there's also a lot of uh, protectionist uh, impulses um, and kind of cronyist impulses mm-hmm. that are also keeping the system in place. So the uh, the beer interests and particularly the beer wholesalers and distributors are, are uh, very politically active uh, in Virginia, and they have uh, a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is because uh-huh. the beer and wine are relatively unregulated uh, and controlled uh, uh-huh. by ABC, at least compared to distilleries. And of course, they look at hard liquor as a competitive threat to them, so they're you know pretty happy with the way things are right now. And and so it makes kind of all these factors that make. Legislative change really, really hard. A lot of, uh, even last year, and you see this every year, the distilleries often try to get reform legislation through the Virginia Assembly, and, and it almost always fails, or they have really piecemeal reforms instead of actually, you know, revamping the whole system. You mentioned uh, viticulture, the wine industry, and and beer is growing as well. As a matter of fact, I was told that a- agriculturally, Central Virginia is some of the best beer growing climate out there. Even if we're not known for growing that, but we have certainly got uh, an awful lot of government interest in the wine industry. Uh, both Bob McDonald and Terry McAuliffe, even more so, have quote invested. And I hate that phrase because if I gave right. my money to a venture capitalist, I could choose to take it back. I can't take my money back from the government um, if they're investing in things that I don't like. But given that investment in the wine industry, uh, you almost see a conflict of interest if Virginia is going to regulate one type of industry uh, and then invest in the other one. If you did that as a private citizen, I think there are several federal penitentiaries you might go to. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good point. And, and not only is it wineries, but a lot of breweries have gotten tax and incentives and different oh, yeah. things 
sweeten the pot for them to open up operations here. So not only do they face you know less regulations on the back end, but they're also being incentivized uh, and having the government you know sometimes play mm-hmm. favorites with them. And, and that's not what the distilleries want, of course. The distilleries just want you know to be treated on the same level as far as all these sure. you know government regulations and taxes that they face. So they're not you know asking for us. But at least the ones I've talked to are not asking for you know special handouts or or government grants or anything like that. They just you know literally want to be treated on the same the same way as the other mm-hmm. alcohol producers in the state, which from a logical standpoint should make complete sense and should be something that you think everyone could get behind. Do the the distillers that you speak to, uh, Jared Dieterly of the R Street Institute, uh, and I know some of mine, some of my friends who are distillers, uh, find it interesting that there's this zeal in Richmond all of a sudden to legalize marijuana growing and selling and taxing, uh, yet uh, you know we, we will treat liquor as if it's more of a heinous product or more of a government-regulated uh, industry than even now the zeal is to create a, a, a newly legalized marijuana industry. Yeah, one of the distillers I, I actually talked to, uh, she she actually uh, said something to the effect, you know, we're not running some criminal enterprise here. We're literally just producers in a state. We're a small business, mm-hmm. and and you know, we're just trying to do something that makes people happy and a service that people enjoy. And she pointed out to her tasting room, and, and I, you know, I looked out there, and she was right. Everyone was having a good time. This isn't malicious. Oh, yeah. stuff that's happening, and, and I think they very much feel like they're being treated like that. Uh, it's amazing a lot of the uh, you know they're telling me some of the things that lobbyists have told them that are trying to keep the status quo and affect you know things like how you know liquor will always be known in Virginia as demon water and all this totally hyperbolic stuff and I, and you know we, prohibition was repealed a long time ago it seems like we've kind of moved past that point where you know liquor is just uh, looked at as some you know really bad thing or substance mm. that people shouldn't be able to to have and as you say there's other things like marijuana that there's been proposals to legalize so it's it's kind of this a warped perception of of, uh, how alcohol should be uh, treated in the state. Let me ask you this, because you bring up small business. We're not talking about doers. We're not talking about Jack Daniels. We're talking about family businesses that are smaller often than many of the Virginia wineries uh, is yes. really who suffers. As with most things in a regulation in this regulatory capture, the big guys can fold it into their cost of operations because they're a national thing. But if you're just a little distiller in Nelson County, Virginia, uh, that's that's onerous. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's the the main thing. I mean, none of the big distilleries. Uh, this you see this across, as you said, all industries. But the but the big boys, you know, they can pay for the compliance and for the lawyers and for all the stuff they need to survive, and they can deal with the higher tax rates. But it's the little people that can. And one of the distillers I talked to mentioned that just from their on-premise sales, when they sell a bottle of liquor in their tasting room, for example, if they, for the last two years, if they'd been located in Pennsylvania instead of Virginia, they would have saved three hundred over $300,000 in uh, taxes. Oh, and that's... that's a lot of money for a little distillery. I mean, they're not able to deal with that. And you see it from everything, you know, with bottle orders, too. The distilleries have to send all the proceeds uh, from their sales to ABC, and then they get their share back a month later. Oh. And again, that creates cash flow problems for mm-hmm. the little distilleries. I mean, you know, they have to order, you know, up to 20,000 bottles at a time, um, and, you know, that costs whatever, you know, $90,000, I think is what I was told. And, you know, Jack Daniels can cover the cost of that. They can pay easily for that, but the little distilleries have a lot of trouble actually making ends meet and managing their cash flow in, in environments like that. So you're right, it absolutely hurts the small people, the entrepreneurs that you'd think we'd be trying to encourage because they create local jobs are being hurt the most. Well, you talk about $300,000. That's a good number of local jobs per distillery if each one has a similar experience, uh, Jarrett. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And and the issue is is that some of the owners of this distillery are, are working, you know, 90, 100-hour weeks, and they don't even have – they're not even making enough to pay themselves salaries. They're doing it as a side job or they're, uh, you know, having other income come in to support them. And if they can't pay themselves, then, you know, they're not able to support many other people and many other salaries and jobs that they're – 
uh, their plants in their manufacturing areas. And I think they'd all like to get bigger, and they would like to do that. They've told me that, but they're not able to because they're paying so much in taxes and dealing with so many regulatory barriers. Why, even the stars of that uh, A&E series, or was it the History Channel, whatever cable, you know, the uh, the Moonshiners, they were in southwest Virginia, and uh, and they do pretty well for themselves, too, now, uh, apparently. But, uh, Jared, let me ask you the other side of this. We talked about that coalition uh, that formed against Bob McDonald's uh, attempt to get out of the ABC business, to shutter them, to sell the stores off, to privatize it. Uh, and the other side was the predictable left wingers who you would run around with their hair on fire talking about lost tax revenue. There are states. I grew up in New York State. They don't have an ABC. They do have a taxing authority over liquor sales, but they don't control it the way Virginia does. And I don't see them having any trouble generating the revenue because it seems like to me, if you got rid of the cost of running the stores and all the other things and just focused on a much more simple tax revenue on the sale of distilled spirits, uh, you, you might not make the eye-popping dollar amount, but it also wouldn't cost you as much to to generate that tax revenue. That's right, and, and the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, because there's a lot of other states that don't, as you said, have control states, and they just, you know, they have excise taxes and different forms of uh, taxes that they charge on on liquor, but they don't have government-run stores, and, you know, they're all able to operate, and the government's not closing tomorrow in any of those places. I think the difficult thing is once you have a system like ABC where they can mark up the bottles as much as they want, even Mm -hmm. if it's not industry norms, they can mark them up like in Virginia nearly 70 percent, it can become, uh, you know, a big cash infusion for them. I think in recent years, ABC in Virginia has raked in something like $100 million or something for, for the state and, and profits. And you need to see it even though I was just reading an article the other day that Virginia legislators this year are trying to get even more money to squeeze out of uh, ABC to help close uh, budget gaps. So uh, it, it, even if you accept the premise that ABC can make money, you're right. I mean, that's kind of questionable because there's a lot of you know jobs that it's, it's supporting and salaries they have to pay. But even if you accept it, it still doesn't really make sense that you know this has to be the mechanism that the state's raising money for its general fund through. I mean, there's other ways to balance the budget, right? You can you know cut taxes or you can cut tax spending, or you could maybe argue for a general tax increase or, mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. But it's it's totally uh, arbitrary that this one industry is is being uh, burdened basically to keep afloat the Virginia budget. Well, and you mentioned this is an intransparent tax increase. They did it last year as well, where they just, uh, you know, did that. Nobody knew about it. And you went in and said, oh, I'm the Uncle P- Uncle Wiggly or whatever it is, bourbon is now $30 a bottle instead of 25 And that uh, that's all profit for the state, as it were. Jarrett Dieterle of R Street Institute in Washington, D.C., talking about distilled spirits, the ABC, uh, and where we go from here. Talk about the landscape. Certainly, uh, there is a gubernatorial candidate uh, who is a distiller, so I one can imagine we can interview him at a later date about this. Uh, but what do you hear? We have the entire Virginia General Assembly up for re-election. Um, some of them are facing opponents, some of them not, uh, and we can at some other point visit the idea of gerrymandering uh, with, at a later show as well. But with the General Assembly up for re-election, as well as the gubernatorial races, uh, what are you hearing regarding reform ABC, or has this become such a uh, backburner story that you and I are sort of bringing it to the fore for the first time, this gubernatorial chase? Well, well, I think that it's something people are interested in in Virginia. There's no doubt. It's the, the problem. It's getting people to actually, uh, you know, on uh, in Richmond to actually move on this. And the problem is, every single year, people get excited that this is going to be the year that the ABC will be reformed, and then it never happens. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, not to be pe- pessimistic about it, but I'm just not sure that uh, there's going to be enough change quickly enough to really change things. I mean, the the current. Uh, uh, gubernatorial administration in Virginia has been, you know, if anything, has sought to 
expand the ABC in many oh, ways, yeah. Oh, yeah. and I'm, I'm just not sure. The, again, the, the kind of lobbying interests and the, the beer distributor interests and a lot of other vested interests really want to keep the status quo the way it is, and they contribute a lot to Virginia politicians. So I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not sure that how much uh, likelihood there is for a change uh, you know, in the coming uh, weeks and months, but uh, you know, certainly it's something that I think is at least publicly has gained more attention that this is an antiquated system that needs to be fixed. Is it possible, and I look in the activist's eye and, and think in terms of how can we push the agenda, even if it isn't the root cause of it, uh, there is a symptom of the ABC, uh, and it is the ABC policing. And some of the, the darkest moments in ABC history have not been these you know hidden taxes that certainly have happened but haven't gotten the press, but have been instances like St. Patrick's Day or the young lady who was uh, you know, chased across a parking lot with guns unwielding ABC police officers for buying a a 12-pack of sparkling cans of water uh, and then harassed and chased in her car by these, you know, SWAT team wannabes. Uh, Can we, at least uh, from the public standpoint, get some sympathy for perhaps closing down this division of government based on the fact that uh, not only do they not do liquor management well, but they also don't do liquor law enforcement very well? Yeah, and I think what you struck on there is an accountability issue, too, at the end of the day. I mean, if they do things like you just mentioned, or even even when they raise, uh, even financial things, when they mm-hmm. raise the markup on, on liquor, there's no real accountability. Uh, it's it's a bureaucracy, essentially, that's doing it. And, yeah. and they can, you know, basically by themselves raise markups and by themselves have uh, enforcement uh, practices uh, that can be problematic. And so there's no real way, even if the public's upset, to vote them out of office. And I think that uh, at the very least, creating more accountability would be something you'd think that people could get behind. It would be supportive of, of changing uh, in, in the coming years. Uh, and meanwhile, the General Assembly members get to get off scot-free because they can raise revenue right. without ever having to have cast a vote on it one way or the other. Yeah, exactly. So they don't have to right. They don't have to put their names on on the record essentially uh, for a, a mark. Which what is as you said is a de facto tax increase when the when the liquor is marked up. So yeah, it's, it's the best of both worlds for everyone. Is everyone can just pass the buck to the other person and they can feign outrage and be upset about it, but there's no real accountability. Is, is it an issue? And the reason I brought up some of the policing issues is because at least there the public has become aware even of the ABC existing or that there's an issue there. Uh, talk about the lengths that one really needs to go to, because I, I haven't seen a lot of polling data that even brings these questions up in the polls that have been taken regarding the gubernatorial race. Uh, some of these polling agencies, Christopher Newport, et cetera, they don't seem to even bring up the idea of reforming ABC anymore as a question uh, for those who they're polling uh, a top line at the gubernatorial race. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is just because it's it's hidden to a lot of consumers. You know, they don't know the reason that uh, you know in Virginia, even if a distiller wants to sell a bottle of booze for twelve dollars, it ends up costing north of twenty five, and that's mostly because of government markups and taxes. They don't know that. They just go into the store and they just see that this bottle is twenty five dollars, and they're mm-hmm. busy and on their way somewhere, and yeah. they buy it. So I think the, a big part of it is is just lack of awareness mm-hmm. about this stuff. And you're right in the police situations. I think people it's more visible, and there's been more press of those type things. Uh, but a lot of people in Virginia, I think, have just come to kind of accept this ABC system, and, you know, they don't know. They look around and they see that there's a lot of breweries popping up and wineries popping up and even some distilleries that are uh, mm-hmm. starting to do their best in the state. And I think that people just think that, well, you know, this is just uh, how things are, and we, we don't know that there's all this uh, things going on in the background that are affecting how, how A, how these companies and producers are able to uh, survive and thrive in the state, and B, how it's actually impacting our wallets mm-hmm. uh, from a day-to-day basis. Everyone sees their income tax bill, Right at, yeah. at the end of the year, but but not a lot of people, you know, think about how they might be getting taxed through buying a bottle of booze. Right, or and and then you create the idea of precedent for anything. Jared, last one: Are there any examples we can look to where states had been uh, control states, as it's called, like we are in Virginia, uh, where they had their own ABC that have gotten out of that business in the last few years? Um, I'm not sure about uh, the last few years uh, specifically, but but yeah, there certainly has. Uh, been cases. I mean, West West Virginia, uh, several decades ago, they actually still have government control of uh, the wholesale level, but actually at the retail level, they 
um, ended up uh, uh, basically turning that over to private mm-hmm. uh, liquor stores that could buy licenses. And, and there's a lot of examples in different states of, uh, of them moving more towards free market, uh, free market models. Um, so it's certainly something that has been done throughout history, and, and, and that's not a, you know, an excuse for Virginia. I mean, most states are not control states nowadays, so that shows that, uh, if anything, they're in the minority, mm-hmm. and it's, uh, it's not like uh, this is something that's common practice across all states. It's impossible to change. Yeah, but all those states probably have to actually go through their general assembly to raise the excise taxes on the liquors. So that's probably the big reason. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate it. Where can people read more of your stuff from the R Street Institute, Jared? Uh, we actually write a lot about uh, uh, alcohol policy and other governance issues just at rstreet.org. Uh, and um, we have uh, various other articles in different publications like the American mm-hmm. Conservative, American Spectator. Well, thank you so much for taking some time out this weekend. Uh, Again, it's not one of those forefront issues, but when you talk about unthrottled ability to raise revenue in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it's one that we should be putting on the front burner, or at least in a larger glass, as it were. Uh, Jarrett, thank you so much, and you have a wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Coming up next, Sally Pipes from the Pacific Research Institute repeal and replace, really? We'll get into that next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio.